Thanks for coming back this week. It's good to have you all here again. I think we're going to jump on in and get started in this webinar. And some folks will still pop in as we get rolling here. So today we are talking about uh, unpacking the components of MTSS. We'll do a brief overview of what we talked about last time we met last week in our first webinar. So we'll build on that. We'll talk about the components of MTSS, and we'll also talk about building highly functioning MTSS teams. So this is our agenda for today. We'll start with a brief welcome. And we are in a webinar format today, so it's a little bit different than last time we met. We have more folks on the call, which is wonderful, and we're so excited. Uh, so we have it in a webinar format today, so we can't see you. You can see us, and we are going to keep our screens on, um, but we can't see you, but we still are hoping to engage with you just like we did last week. We're hoping to engage with you in the chat. Um so again, like last week, the session is recorded and we've already hit record, so we're already rolling and made available to you either via our YouTube channel or and or um, through a link that's sent to you generally within 24 hours of the presentation with any resources that we have loaded in here, any handouts, any links, uh, and then of course the slide deck. So you'll get the recording slide deck and any resources. Um, again, just want to stress that you're you're definitely encouraged to participate. Um, we had some great dialogue last week and a lot of good questions and some nice feedback. So um, we did read your feedback and thank you. And we're going to continue to use that feedback to build uh, this webinar series as we go forward. You can use the um, raise the hand feature in the chat. We'll monitor that, but you're also welcome to pop any questions you have just in the chat. You don't have to use the Q&A per se. Feel free to just use that chat and we'll um, we'll just monitor between Tammy and I who's, who's going to be checking in the chat. And then again, we have a feedback survey for you. So this week, as soon as you sign off, it will pop up on your screen. So we just ask that you take a minute. It doesn't take long, but just please send us your thoughts and give us your feedback. Great, just a quick snippet if you weren't with us this uh, last week. Um, I'm Lauren Mercier and I'm with Tammy Hilton. We're from Demonstrated Success. We're an education consulting company based off the seacoast in New Hampshire. We are primarily working through the state of New Hampshire as well as holding contracts in the state of Maine and Vermont as well. So you can see on the screen some of the things that our company provides uh, school districts, schools, and teachers with support. Uh, we work a lot with data, uh, effective PLC teaming, data use, MTSS, of course, is why you're here. We focus in on ELA and math curriculum and instruction, coaching and modeling, leadership cultivation, and we do a lot of SEL and culture and climate work as well. So um, there are a couple handfuls of us in the company, and we all have you know varied expertise, and we bring that expertise together to support educators um, locally. So we're happy to have you with us. So this is the second of five webinars, one hour long. The first webinar last week was just that basic understanding of building a multi-tiered system of support. Again, today we're unpacking the components. We touched upon them at the end of the webinar last week. We're going to delve a little bit deeper this week, and we'll talk about the framework for building effective teams. Next session, which is next week, we will talk about the stages of uh, MTSS implementation. And then the fourth session is about evidence-based practices and data use, accountability measures, progress monitoring. And then March 8th, so we'll give a couple weeks for those February vacations. Um, March 8th, we'll talk about supporting students on a continuum. Great. So we are in Vermont for a two-day workshop at the end of the month, the 30th and the 31st. That is really a culmination after participating in these webinars. Um, teams come, so it's a it's a group of um, ideally four to six people from your tier one team and or your tier two, three team. And you come, you work, you leave with a strategic plan for implementation. It's really individualized work. Tammy and I will be there, but we also bring um, other colleagues with us. So we try to individualize support as best we can during this um, two-day program. You don't have to have attended the five, day, uh, the five webinars to come to this workshop. It's just helpful to have a little background knowledge, um, but we really do dive right into the framework and how it works for your school um, because it is so 
individualized and personalized. I do believe we are targeting the area of Montpelier just based on some interest and some feedback that we've been receiving. Um, so it doesn't say that on here yet, but I think it will next time you join us. So uh, keep that in mind. So that's Vermont at the end of March. And then we're in Maine, which we're excited about in Biddeford at the beginning of the month, uh, March 9th and 10th. And same thing. Um, we were also in Maine in November and had some great teams come work with us. So um, heading back to Maine based on some interest and some feedback. So looking forward to that. I'm Lauren Mercier. Um, I am an educational consultant with Demonstrate Success. I was in the public school for about 17 years, left in 2021, and I have a background as a classroom teacher. I taught high school Spanish and then uh, school counseling at the high school level. And then my most recent position was in a K-8 school as an administrator, supporting school counselors and um, managing student behavior. Uh, so that is some of my background. And I love talking about SEL and multi-tiered system of support and ways that we can support our students and ways that we can support our staff as well. And I'm Tammy Hilton. I am also a demonstrated success and Lauren's colleague. Um, I was also in the public education for just almost 20 years before coming to demonstrated success. I started off as a classroom teacher, um, high school English. I did do a couple of years um, as a you know, middle school English teacher, but my heart was in high school. From there, I moved up to becoming an instructional coach um, and building leaner. And um, now I'm with Demonstrated Success. I am also very passionate about, you know, supporting schools with their multi-tiered systems of support, how we can support students, staff, um, and really work towards those improved student outcomes um, from the whole child perspective. Thanks, Tammy. And we have um, a photo of Karen Matso. She's our director of professional development, and she often um, floats into this series, and she is generally present when we do our two-day workshops as well. So we work with her, we consult with her on feedback and developing the program. So we just thought we'd give her a, some a shout out here. Great. Um, for those of you that were with us last week, you saw this word cloud. These are some words that Tammy and I came up with when we thought about the implementation of the multi-tiered system of support framework. Um, sometimes this framework feels daunting. Uh, sometimes it's posed as an initiative, as a now we've got to do this, right? And it's a, it's all the, you know, all the buzz now we've got to put MTSS into place. Um, but we really want you to come out of this webinar series uh, with the belief that implementing a, um, a solid multi-tiered system of support framework in your building is doable um, and that it really is, you know, personalized to each individual school. So hopefully, you know, through our messaging and um, the way we present information, you can feel that there's different ways to do things kind of following the guidelines of the framework because every school is different. Every school has different needs. Um, so you can definitely personalize it, adapt it to your needs, adapt it to your resources. Our hope is that it's a feasible framework to help impl uh, to implement. And when we say feasible, we're thinking about, you know, using what you have, the human resources and the material resources that you have in place before thinking about having to buy something, a new program, uh, a new person, hiring a new person to put in place to support your students. So we want you to feel, um, you know, that it is a feasible um it's feasible and it's comprehensive. Again, you know, this goes academic support, social emotional support and behavior support. We really hone in on that whole child approach. And, um, you know, with the idea that every student will have equitable access to resources that they need to be successful in their school. So in terms of our objectives today, Participants will develop an understanding of the components within the framework. Again, we're diving deeper and then learn to establish those effective teams for successful implementation of MTSS. All right, so we're going to jump in. We're going to start with the key components of MTSS. So if we were to think about MTSS as a big umbrella, um, the components that are going to appear on your screen are kind of like what would be encompassed underneath the umbrella. It's really all about the 
it's these systems that you're going to see that work together every day to make up the whole framework. And so the first one we have is staff collaboration and engagement. This is really getting to the idea of efficacy. Professional development is also really key when it comes to MTSS. Data, we mentioned this last week, data use and accountability measures. Data is huge um, in driving the MTSS framework and all of these um, interconnected systems that fall within it. We have curriculum and instruction, um, especially at the tier one level. Tier one um, has to be strong so that um, you know everything else can fall into place, whether we're talking about academics, behavioral, or social emotional. Effective teams. Lauren's going to spend some time later on in the webinar series talking about that. I mean, later on in this webinar, talking about this, and we'll continue to talk about it throughout the series. Social emotional learning and positive behavior measures. And then student, family, and community involvement. So as you can see from this list, these are all systems that you already have existing within your building. Um, and this is why we truly want you all to walk away feeling like MTSS is not something that is in addition to what you're already doing. It really is about um, everything that you do all day, every day within a school system. And so with that being said, we're going to jump into each one of these a bit deeper, um, starting with staff collaboration and engagement in this idea of efficacy. So you want to make sure that you're offering as many opportunities as possible for staff to collaborate and engage with each other throughout this work. So um, when we think about that, we have to go with the idea that John Hattie puts out there all the time about efficacy. Now, when we say efficacy, we are talking about like meaning, measure, impact on student achievement. Efficacy is really what brings out the accountability um, that we mentioned when it comes to data and really um, drives the question of, are we really helping the students that we serve? When we think about self-efficacy, it's really that belief in ourself, um, that we are playing a key role in, in influencing those outcomes that we want to see in our students. And then as a collective group, you're also doing um, this, you know, it's that shared belief that you can have that positive impact on students. So this here is just a handout. Um, it's an activity that we sometimes do when we go into schools, like at the start of the school year, that really helps them think about um, not only ways that they can engage their staff throughout the systems within the MTSS framework, but how are we going to build that sense of collective efficacy, this growth mindset, um, this camaraderie that we really need to make this work. And so these are just some different places in a typical school where um, one might offer staff those moments of collaboration, engagement, and autonomy, meaning like choice and voice. Um, so it could be done through staff meetings. It could be done through staff surveys. It's kind of nice every now and then, you know, whether it's every quarter, every trimester, every other month to send out some staff surveys and get um, that feedback. That is data. Um, peer observations, you know, if you have a system in place in your school where you might have peer observations or instructional rounds or um, whatever you might call them, that is also a great way to collect some data to really get staff buy-in to work on those tier one practices. And then staff leadership teams. Lauren's going to get into teams a bit more shortly in this webinar, but an MTSS team would be a great place to start for some of your staff. So then the next thing we're going to talk about is professional development. So when we think about professional development, it should be ongoing. It should not be a one and done kind of thing. You want it embedded throughout the year. Um, to offer staff those opportunities to keep coming back to the things that you set or you might set as priority areas um, in your MTSS tier one team. Differentiation, you know, just like with students, we want to understand that staff have a really wide variety of skills and backgrounds and expertise that they're bringing to the forefront. And so you want to think about how you can value these and leverage these um, and really use them to your advantage when it comes to um, 
you know, your professional development and the ways that you can offer sort of homegrown type stuff. You want it to be consistent. So again, make sure the message and the, the, excuse me, the delivery of professional development is similar every time. You do not want staff to start receiving mixed messages um, about information that you really want them to have, nor do you want them to start receiving any contradictions. You know, staff turnover is also a consideration. So as people come and go in your buildings, you want to make sure that new staff are trained um, and that the staff that have already been there are comfortable. You know, sometimes we all need a, a refresher. It should be timely and relevant. So if staff needs arise um, in regards to their own learning, you want to make sure that you give them the opportunities immediately to get that help. So if behavior strategies are on the plan for March, but you see that it's a need in October, you want to wait, you want to have that professional development start happening in October. Don't wait for March just because it's on your calendar. You also want to think about, you know, evaluating it periodically. We talked about the data cycle a little bit last week and how we always, you know, we implement, um, we analyze, we reflect, you know, you would want to do the same thing with your professional development um, as well. Like, look at those systems in place. Are they functioning the way that they should be? Is there things missing? What changes do we need to make? And then it should be teacher driven. Again, we want to allow teachers and staff to have a choice or a say in the PD that they receive, you know, to make it more meaningful and relevant for them. You know, what is it that they want to learn? So now we're gonna talk about data use and accountability measures. And you'll see that a lot of these are intertwined with each other. It's really hard to separate them out because again, these are all the working systems and frameworks within the MTSS greater framework that's happening. Um, when we think about data, it is important to think about having a place where you have sort of one house location for all of your data. A lot of schools are going towards shared drives or folders for this, um, but there's lots of types of data that go into the MTSS system. And so here's some different ideas. It could be your universal screeners. So whether that is your NWEA or your STAR or your FMP benchmarks or you know, any type of those things that you give all kids so many times a year. It could be pre and post assessments that you might do within unit cycles or um, throughout your PLC cycles. You wanna think about your progress monitoring systems. So things like your running records, your formative assessments, your dibbles, anything that you're using to sort of progress monitor um, throughout. And again, it could be formative or summative. Teacher observation. So again, think about peer inst instructional rounds. If you don't have them, um, think about the administrative process and all of this, but all of that is data. We talked about staff surveys a couple minutes ago. Parent and student surveys are also really great ways to collect data on lots of different things. So this ensures collaboration, this ensures that all voices are heard, and it really helps focus the learning on um, those specific outcomes and what schools can do. And then finally, any state or local assessments um, as well. So whether that's your SATs, if you're in the high school, or um, you know, in New Hampshire, I know they have the New Hampshire SAS. Um, so any sort of those state assessments as well. All right, so now let's talk about curriculum and instruction. So remember, it all starts with tier one. Tier one is your foundation for all of this work. So make sure that it is high leverage practices. Make sure that it is including all students, um, that you are emphasizing core instructional skills and that whatever it is, it is meeting the needs of at least 80% of your students overall. You also want to think about your student learning outcomes. Do students really understand what they are learning or why they're learning it? And, you know, how to get to the expected result that the educators want to see. Are the outcomes posted somewhere in the room for students to refer to? Are they referred to by the teacher and or the students throughout the class? Those are all things to think about when we want, when we say clearly defined outcomes. 
You also want to have clearly defined look fors at tier one. These are more for like teacher outcomes, right? Teachers need to be aware of what it is that you are specifically looking for. What practices and frameworks, regardless of whatever curriculum you have, do you want to see when anyone walks in the classroom or throughout the building? So some examples might include restorative practices, community meetings, differentiated instruction, um, common academic language, flexible seating. It's those types of things that we talk about here when we think about tier one look fours. Fidelity. This, um, you want to think about defining. It's a term that is thrown around everywhere in education. Um, you know, but I bet you if you ask every person in your building, they'd have a different definition. Um, so, you know, what does this mean? What's everyone's understanding of this term? What does it mean for a program or a practice? Teacher support, again, with those instructional rounds, some schools will call them professional growth partners, others say peer observations. There's lots of ideas or names I mean for this concept, but think about what your school has in place to support teachers in regards to their curriculum and instruction beyond a specialist or beyond a coach, which many schools don't have. Right. And that's totally OK, because it goes back to this idea of leveraging the expertise that you already have in your building and given, giving staff the opportunities for collaboration and engagement in that process. And then they want to be evidence based. Right. So what does the research say out there about the curriculum and practices that you're using at the tier one level? Regardless if we're talking about academics, SEL, or any kind of behavioral based thing that you are doing. Um, and we will dive into evidence based practices in webinar four of the series. So we're not going to go much further than that right now. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about briefly is effective teams. Lauren's going to get into this a lot. Um, in just a few minutes, but this is a wheel that you're going to see um, throughout the rest of this webinar today, these are the six components um, that make up an effective team. So they all work in tandem with each other to create an effective whole team lens. Um, so you want to remember, you are only as strong as your weakest team member. So these components really aim to strengthen all team members individually to work towards the efficacy um, and the functioning of that whole group. And so we can see here that they're having norms and roles, clearly articulated, um, consistent protocols, clear communication, the shared measurable articulated goals, an accountability process, and timelines. And so Lauren will talk to you about all of those in just a couple minutes. Social emotional learning and positive behavior measures. So Tier one, remember, is school-wide, right? So when we think about SEL school-wide, it's those expectations. So again, for some, it might be morning meetings. For others, it might be advisories um, or community meetings. When we start thinking about tier two, we're thinking about small groups. So this could be lunches. This could be book groups. This could be school counseling groups. These are really focused on kids who... Um, are struggling or need enrichment with school-wide expectations. Again, whether it's academic, behavioral, or social, it, social, emotional, it could go either way um, or for any of those. But this is why we say that they can be implemented by any staff member. It's really based on the needs of the student. And then tier three is traditionally working with students on um, behavior plans or developing behavior plans, maybe meeting with outside counselors, Remember, the only difference between tier two and three supports, um, whether it's for enrichment or support um, for those that are struggling with something, is the intensity or the frequency. And then um, also thinking about social emotional learning and positive behavior, we have the five pillars of CASEL that you really want to take into account. And so those we can see here um, right in the middle. So we have the self-awareness where kids are really coming to understand their own strengths and weaknesses, um, as well as thinking about how their behavior is influencing other people. We have self-management where they are learning to regulate their own emotions and behaviors, which includes processes like stress or time management or motivation. Could also be academic or personal goal setting in this, which is all extremely important for kids to um, have as they grow and start managing their own schedules um, and things as they get older. 
Social awareness is when kids are really learning to understand the social behavioral norms and recognizing other people's emotions and emphasizing, um, I'm sorry, empathizing with people of all different backgrounds and cultures. Relationship skills um, are all about helping kids foster those healthy relationships and those clear communications um, with individuals or groups. And then finally, responsible decision-making is all about helping them make their own independent choices, whether it's personal or academic um, and taking into consideration, you know, possible consequences, safety concerns, um, things like that. And then finally, MTSS is big on student, family, and community involvement. So again, it's staff and teachers are very important in this, but it's about the whole perspective of looking at it from um, the student, the staff, the families, and then the greater community. So when we think about student involvement, we, um, you know, could have leadership panels, student government, or different types of groups like that. We mentioned the surveys a couple minutes ago, letting them get their voices heard. It is after all their learning. So let them have a part of it every now and then. Collective decision-making, This an example of this might be like a restorative practice where students are part of the discipline process for within the school. Candid conversations, you know, you can gain a lot of information from kids regardless of what age we are dealing with. They have no problem being honest for the most part when it comes to um, certain things. Goal setting, um, this is within all aspects of the MTSS thinking. Um, and then celebrating growth, you know, really thinking about do kids get to celebrate their learning? Do staff get to celebrate their learning? Um, but we're talking about kids here, you know, thinking about do they get to celebrate when they make their goals, things like that. Family involvement. These are just some different ways you can see here on the screen that you might involve families. So um, for special ed students, it could be the IEP building. Um, you could do different school events, which I know schools are starting to do now more as um, you know things open up again post-COVID. Volunteer opportunities, you know, let them come in and volunteer um, in the classroom or after school or on field trips. Some schools do interactive homework where parents and students are working together and offering feedback to teachers. It could be joint professional development opportunities. So this um, might be when families and educators in the communities learn together about a specific topic. Cultural and language liaisons, um, you know, so this might be things like the Remind app, some schools use Class Dojo, uh, ELL specialists for homeschool communications are all examples of this. Um, some schools will do some incentive communication. So, I mean, inventive communication. So this is like newsletters or social media or breakfast or luncheons or things like that. And finally, family advisory teams. Um, this is where schools might ask parents for input and thoughts around various aspects of their child's learning. And then finally, community involvement. Um, so this might be local businesses working together to make sure kids get what they need. So um, in the community I came from, we did a Stuff the Bus campaign at the start of every school year where, um, you know, teachers were handed bags of school supplies and tissues and things. We also had our local Hannaford did food donation bags every Friday and any kid leaving the building could grab a bag of food to take home with them for the weekend. Paint the town read. So this is when lots of literacy related activities might be going on throughout the town. Like it could be, you know, typically this might happen if it happened in the fall, it could be decorating, you know, painting pumpkin characters or doing cookouts or things like that. Community partners um, and then, you know, other organizations like Big Brothers, Big Sisters, YMCA, things like that. Really anything that's going to foster those positive relationships between families and community members. So, whoops, I'm so sorry. So we wanted to just pause here for just a second and have you think about of all those components, which do you feel are the strongest in your school and which might need um, a little bit of improvement? So we'd love to have you flood the chat for just a second.
Any thoughts? It's a lot to process. It is a lot to process. There are a lot of, a lot to these components. So um, definitely think about it, you know, and hone in in one area, right? As you work to build, you know, your framework, you can't do it all at once. So that's sort of why, you know, we wanted to just have you think about what's going really well, you know, and then what, what do you think needs the most improvement, right? And then how do you kind of work between those two spaces? And Lauren, I think we had someone raise their hand. I'm not sure. Oh, there's a yet. Oh goodness, it says the chat is disabled. No kidding. Hmm. I am not sure. Let's see. Well, we know the question and answer. I will work on that. But how about if you have a thought, can you put it in the the question, and we'll just use it as the chat while we try to figure that out. There's a quick solution. Yeah, that should not be disabled. But um, so with that, with the idea, um, if you do have any questions, like Lauren just said, or comments or things about those components, definitely put them in that Q and A section for now, and we will come back to them at the end of the webinar if anything pops up. But um, I think I fixed it. I think I fixed it. If somebody wants to try to pop something in the chat, let's see if we can do it. I don't know. And that's okay. I'm gonna um okay. I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren right now. Freddie, is- Freddie, the chat is working. Yes, look at this. Okay, sorry, friends. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you, friends. Great. So Thanks like- for letting us know, Aaron and Crystal. Thank you so much. All yeah. right. Good communication with parents yeah. via oh, Facebook. Good. Perfect. Facebook groups. Yep, that's yeah. awesome. Great. Lots, Lots of things to work on. Yep. Yep. That seems to be a consistent theme, no matter where we go um, and work with schools. Great. Great. Good. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for being patient with that for just a second. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thanks for being flexible. So Lauren, Lauren's going to lead us into Teams now. Yes. Okie doke. Um, So in terms of teaming, um, you know, building these effective teams is really a foundational component of a multi-tiered system of support framework. So we're going to spend some time, you know, talking about these MTSS teams. And then, you know, Tammy had, you know, she showed you a pie and we'll kind of take each of those pieces of the pie as we hone in on just an effective team, whether it's MTSS or your PLC or your grade level, um, you can flex that information. But for the purpose of this webinar, of course, we'll keep it with the MTSS lens, but you can take those tenets and and use them for all your, you know, all your teams. But essentially, we're going to consider three teams when we're thinking about multi-tiered system of support. So we're going to think about a building, excuse me, a district leadership team, a building leadership team, and or tier one team. So we're going to use that interchangeably. Um, We really are, you know, we feel strongly that your tier one team can actually be your building leadership team and that MTSS doesn't need to be just teams on the side, that that the, the, the roles and responsibilities of the MTSS tier one team really, um, fall in line with those roles and responsibilities of a building leadership team. And then a tier two, three team. And we'll consider that one team um, for the sake of this presentation. In larger schools, you may actually have two separate teams, um, but a lot of schools are combining the two and the three in terms of um, supporting their students. So here you see this um, image and It's just really talking about that communication between the building leadership team or the tier one team and then the district. So there has to be a lot of communication and collaboration between these two groups. And so when we think about that district team, you know, the district really is providing the vision for all of the schools within, right? And so we're able to fall back on that district team and have them garner that political support, right, with your school board, with your outside community. Um, We want to have this district team commit to prioritizing MTSS so that 
um, when you need to access funding to support this framework, you can do that. You have that there and that you have, you know, your district officials um, recognize that need. And so that's why it's, you know, really important to have you know, folks on that district side who understand this multi-tiered system of support framework. Um, these folks are also, again, um, <clears throat> prioritizing trainings, right? And if your schools within your district, if you have a couple of elementary schools, hopefully they're using similar programming, same programming, uh, and not doing maybe five different things. Um, but this is where you could come back to that district team and align, make sure everyone's receiving relevant training and, you know, so that all of your students who end up in the same middle school, for example, um, have that same type of foundation, right? And they really do work to, um, oops, if you could just pop back. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You know, it's right. This, these next couple of slides are kind of interchangeable. I'm just kind of chatting to the image right now, but, um, you know, this, this district team really does work to remove the barriers for full implementation because you need folks, um, at that level to make some of those decisions for you. Um, those are, you know, decisions of budgeting, staffing, et cetera. And then the um, tier one team you can see again, and I have a little bit more in depth for you um, in the coming slides, but again, those components that Tammy talked about in terms of the collection of the data, um, developing the plans, right? Uh, monitoring and coordinating the schedules, the resources, and other teams in the building. And we'll dive a little bit deeper in just a second because there's, there is more to this. But essentially, the point of this image is really to see the connection and the coordination needed between these two groups specifically. All right, Tammy, you can pop forward. Thanks. Um, we talked a little bit about this. I'm not going to talk to this slide, really. It's just laid out a little bit differently, but, um, you know, making sure you have a district team is really, really important. Um, it just makes going about this a lot more streamlined. And so when you think about district team, you know, your membership can include either a superintendent, assistant, assistant superintendent, a representative of a school board, um, your building principals, most likely or and or an assistant principal from your sending schools, like all the schools within your district. Um, you're going to think about your special education director. If you have a district coordinator for that um, or you have a district coordinator for school counseling, um, those types of folks will be there. And then hopefully there's someone in the mix that has a specific eye on multi-tiered system of support. So again, it's not for one person to implement, but having a coordinator for the framework is really, really helpful, especially when you have several schools working to implement and establish. Uh, the building leadership team. So here's a little bit more um, in depth about this team and how we can kind of see how this is like your building leadership team. Although of course it looks different in every school, but again, we're collecting, interpreting and evaluating the data this team are really, they are the stewards of the school's strategic plan, right? And so when, just for example, when we do our workshop, when we, when we, or, and, or when we work with schools individually outside of the workshop for this, um, we have this tier one team establishing goals and creating a strategic plan. Um, and so this team really, they are the stewards of that plan. You know, they're thinking about staffing, schedules, resources, school level teams, school safety, and all these components are, are within that coordination and monitoring. Um, these folks are adjusting trainings, professional development, as Tammy talked a lot about having relevant training, timely training, consistent, right? And then this group also will um, participate in a process of self-assessment and inventory alignment. So we will include this for you, um, this cell, this readiness assessment for implementation, and we take you through, we'll explain it, but we take you through a couple of different areas and see, um, you know, how you align uh, with tier one practices, data use, leadership teams, et cetera. So um, your culture, right? Culture and climate feel. And then we work you through an inventory alignment. So what do you have, right? What, what, what resources do you have and how do you use them? Um, and so that's all part of that process of this, of this team as well. And so some membership um, could include, again, principal, a school counselor, uh, instructional coaches, you might have your ELA folks, your math folks here, or grade level reps. 
um, or grade span reps. Um, if you're in a K-8, for example, you're not going to have grades K to eight or pre-K to eight sitting at the table, that would be really one huge team with everybody else. But you may choose to have a K2 rep, a three, five rep and a six, eight rep. That might make more sense. Uh, a special educator and or your building coordinator could sit on this team. Uh, ESOL, a UA teacher, unified arts teacher, again, an MTSS coordinator for your building. And then if you had, again, this can flex, right? So if you had a behaviorist or this could be your school counselor, if you didn't have an MTSS coordinator, one of these folks would sit on both teams. So a tier one team and the two, three team to sort of be that liaison between teams, right? And this again is not what it has to be. This is not what it, a, a list that has to be. This is just a list of um great members to include, but you may choose to include other members because of your school community and the staff that you have, and that's great too. So in, in terms of the two, three team, you know, they are really going to ensure that this tier one um, process has, here's that word again, fidelity that Tammy talked a little bit about, but essentially, you know, this team really wants to make sure that before students, um, are presented to the tier two, th three team to be looked at, evaluated for further supports. What's happened in tier one? What are the strategies, the, the tier one strategies that the teachers have tried um, to, to use to work with this student, right? Like it's, it really makes, makes that kind of like a, you know, puts the, the stop sign up and says, wait, before we take on this student, before we consider this student, you know, what's been done? And that data collection piece from the teacher is really important, right? And that progress monitoring piece from the teacher is really important. And being able to use those high leverage practices, that's where this comes into place, right? So we are making sure that we're trying different things before we request assistance from that tier two team. Um, again, this team is going to be responsible for SEL, behavior, and academic needs. Um, I'll just pause and say one thing. If you're a school that's that's um, has highly functioning PLC teams and you're working through those PLCs quite efficiently and effectively, and you also have a place in your schedule like a win block, a what I need block, or a support block that's already in there. So the the tier one practice of PLC yields tier two support, right? So I just I want to just put that piece in here that um, just for example, one school that we're working with has a highly established PLC and win block. So for example, when they right now they're seeing a lot of tier two three, they're focusing more on that SEL behavior request for assistance on tier two three because they're feeling like the PLC in the win are really satisfying um, like tier two supports um, for on the academic side of things. So just, you know, thinking about PLC as a tier one practice um, before we ask for more for students, right? Um, again, we're using data, consulting with staff, and this group coordinates any school or community outreach. So if I have a student that really needs some outside mental health, um, that would be my role on a tier two, three team. Um, once we've gotten to that designation of tier three, I need to reach out and I'm going to look for that. Here are some potential members. Again, we have an administrator that might be your assistant principal on, on this team. Again, a behaviorist might be there if you have one, a social worker and a counselor. Uh, a special educator. This is where your interventionists will come into place. You may have OT, speech, title, um, a math interventionist as well. You may have your nurse on your tier two, three team, right? That makes sense. And then community partners may flex in to your tier two, three team when needed. All right. So let's talk about building these highly effective teams. All right. Thanks, Tammy. Right. So you've seen this before. This is the pie that Tammy showed us. So we're just going to go through each section and Tammy will go to the next slide here. And so we're going to start with established norms and roles. Um, so defined norms and roles will really help create a common expectations that are required to build a positive culture and climate within your building, but especially within your team and then how it functions. So 
Norms and rules help our participants stay active. They help them stay engaged. They help them stay accountable, right, to the process um, of the actual meeting, right? What's said, um, what you decide to do, and how you do those things. Those are, um, we're going to fall back on our norms and, and our roles for that. Um, we should review our norms at the beginning of every meeting, even though you may think everybody knows them. They really are important to review right before every meeting. And you can come back to your norms if you know somebody goes awry, somebody goes off task. Um, you may have a norm that says uh, everyone, you know, everyone stays on task or um don't get in the weeds or whatever your norm is. And if somebody's off task or somebody's just carrying on with something, you could say, hey, we're not going to get in the weeds today or no multitasking. Remember, we said we're not going to multitask in this meeting. Right. And so you can use them kindly to get people back on track and focused um, in your in your meeting. Um, we want to make sure they're posted. Everybody has a copy. If most people are taking notes on an electronic document, they'll be there, um, you know, and so. That would just be, you know, example for the for the um, for the norms. And so, in terms of roles, um, oh yeah, thanks, Tammy. Um, these are just some ideal roles and responsibilities for folks within the team. We generally would have a facilitator in the team, and that person. I'm not going to read all of these. Don't worry. But just as an example, would develop the agenda and distribute it. Right. That might be the role. They may facilitate the dialogue at the table, kind of keep things rolling. They may also say, oh, "You're in the weeds. Come on back." Right. That might be the role of the facilitator. You have a recorder, right? Recording minutes, file keeper, timekeeper. There's just a, there are a lot of roles here. This assumes a larger team, um, but you don't have to have this many roles. The last one we put there was a food dude or a food dudette. Um, that seems to be a big hit in some of the teams that we work with. You know, food goes a long way, especially uh, in an after-school meeting, right? A little chocolate or tea or coffee might might really do the trick. So, um, but again, it just it's just nice to have somebody, you know, in these roles, you're accountable to a certain task and um, and you have the follow through there. These roles can change. You can update them on a monthly basis. You could update them on a quarterly basis. You don't have to be stuck as facilitator per se for a year, um, but it's just, you know, working your people through different roles um, increases accountability to your team. Yeah, so in terms of consistent protocols, Um, you know, you want to make sure that we have protocols that folks follow in terms of your data protocol, your goal setting, uh, when you set goals, your action planning. So a protocol would be your set your goal, your action planning, you're following those steps, right? You're coming back and you're monitoring your progress. So how you do that, right? Um, protocols will ensure rigor in your team process, um, so we know what to expect when we come to a meeting. It's right. So you know exactly what to expect. Your team members know what to expect. It helps to hold everybody accountable. Um, and then it again, it's clearly defined in terms of a process. Here's a protocol that um, looks very much like that data cycle that we showed you last week. This is a data driven protocol. And so when we work, for example, with MTSS teams or with PLC teams, we share this as a way for folks to work through data. And, you know, how are you going to get to a goal, right? When you have your data, when you see your student score. So we kind of work folks through this process of first predicting the data and, you know, thinking about any assumptions you might have as the educator before, oh, I think my students bombed this, or, you know, I know they didn't do well on that, or scores are going to be through the roof. They're going to be excellent. Well, what assumptions do you have? And then taking time to observe the data without reaching any conclusion, right? Just be in the data, just see it, just read it, just take it in. Um, and then interpreting the data and making inference. So cause and effect right here, right? Um, and then we think about implications for our practice. So what works, what's missing, um, what needs to change for our teaching practice to reach our students, right? We see this data, what do we need to do so that we reach our students so that the data they 
the outcomes are better and the data improves, right? And then we reflect on that process. So this is an example, again, of a data-driven dialogue, just as a protocol, right, to follow um, when you look at data. And again, it comes back to expectations and folks know what to do, right? They know what to expect when you look at data. We just work through this cycle. Clear communication. This this kind of doesn't go without saying, but hugely important. And I know that we know this and sometimes communication, we gets the better of us because we get busy. Um, but this is really, really important to have your teams communicate their activities and their goals out to the greater staff, right? We don't want to work in silos. We want folks to know what we're doing. I'm not suggesting folks know about individual student data or individual student plans, but I'm saying, you know, as you establish your MTSS framework and your teams, push that information out to staff, push the information out to parents. What is a multi-tiered system of support framework? Share that with your parents. What are the goals you have for your students? Share that with the parents, right? This is about communicating out your outcomes will be stronger when we do that right and you know having a working document to to have that communication it could be a weekly um, memo from an administrator in your building it could be as an mtss team on the tier one team you push out a monthly update to folks right you can get in there you can review it it can be adjusted you can add on but people know you know what you're working on and that's really important this is just a note-taking template. We have a link for you. You're welcome to use it. Um, but essentially, it's just a template to follow when you take notes. Again, the more structure you have, right, the more protocol you can follow, the more your folks know what to expect and more work you can actually get done, right, when you're following something really simple um, but effective at the same time. Shared and measurable goals. So, you know, goals are going to really help us follow through, right? And we set our goals and we set our action steps. And this, in a second, we're going to show you the classic SMART goal, right? And so, but this really provides, you know, an opportunity for our progress monitoring and our action steps. When we have goals, when we have action items, um, we, we are accountable to what we said. We know who's doing what, we know when they're going to do it. We have an expected completion date, for example, it's not pending. Um, we, I'm just going to pause for a second. I do see a note. We're going to send you when we send you all of this. Oh, thanks, Tammy. Tammy's responding and I want to talk at the same time, but you're going to get all these links. Okay. Um, making sure that you're Action items are measurable. They're tied to that measurable goal, right? That's really, really important. Um, and again, we you review our goals frequently and celebrate, um, much like you would if you're working through a PLC. Hopefully, you're celebrating your student success. You're also celebrating your educator's success, right? And that's really important as you you're establishing this. This framework is to pause and acknowledge what's going well, what you're doing well, um, and, and build from there, right? Because it really is a long process here to kind of get up and running. Here's your SMART goal template, right? So SMART goals must be specific. They must be measurable. They must be achievable and relevant, right? And time bound. So that's your acronym SMART, and those are the steps. So again, you'll have this and you can use this. Again, this could be a protocol, right? Every team in your building is going to establish a SMART goal, right? And every educator in your building might have their own professional SMART goal, right, for the year. Um, they may have, you know, their their goals that they set as they start their cycle of their certification. You may have them making an annual goal. I'm not sure. But again, you could come back to something like this. That way, everyone is doing the same thing. This is an example of this action planning template that we use. Um, and again, it's just an opportunity to write the goal. How are you measuring your goal, right? Is it 85% of your students will satisfy? Is it 100? Is it 95? So um, we will, again, we can embed this, this template um, for you as well. Almost there. Yep. Accountability is huge, right? So we're integrating the work of, you know, of all of this into this larger 
infrastructure of the school. So when teams are meeting and teams are working, it's for the greater good, right, of the building for all of our students. So we have to be accountable to what we say we're going to do. Okay. Um, in terms of like notes, we want to keep things in common locations so that everybody on tier one knows exactly where to locate all tier one documents, right? Your staff knows exactly where to locate all the data they need to do their jobs well. They also know how to interpret all the data to use it, right? So this is all part of that accountability process. Um, great to have administrators attend uh, MTSS meetings, hopefully there's somebody on there, but also grade level meetings and our PLC meetings, bringing the administrators in the mix is very important for those, right? Uploading any notes or artifacts you have. If you create a document, if you create a rubric or um, a walkthrough checklist, for example, of high leverage tier one practices, that would be considered an artifact that if the, your tier one team created it, you'd put it in your common space, right? You're just making a collection. Um, Again, in you know the spirit of holding yourself, holding one another accountable to this process. And then finally, in terms of defined timeline, we want timelines for our work, right? And that's why our goals are timely, they're measurable, and they're relevant, right? So we want to make sure that we are writing goals that we can achieve and that we are aware of our completion date. We can communicate that out to others. Um, you know, we want to make sure that when we're working on something, we communicate that to our staff in terms of when something is going to be done. So let's go back to walkthroughs again. If you're looking to establish on your tier one team uh, an informal walkthrough process where you're looking for, you're having your whole tier one team go out and they are going to be looking in every single classroom. It's it's not evaluative, but they, they have a rubric for walkthroughs. You want to communicate out that to your staff. Here's the rubric. This is what it looks like. Here are the dates we're coming in, right? Make sure all stakeholders have all the information all the time. And then here's the data we collected. Here's what we found. Here's how we can improve, right? So it's that whole process, um, you know, all defined. So again, we're going to just ask you, and we know the chat's up and running, but thinking about teaming, you know, what's going well for you? And you can bring it back specifically to your MTSS team if you want, if you have one. Um, what's going well in terms of those components? You know, what needs attention? Just what are your thoughts? I think everyone's in different places with teams. I know some things one usually comes the consistency part comes up. So I've noted that often teams start out really strong and they do a really good job establishing their routines and their protocols, um, but then maybe get away from their note taking document or maybe get away from their norms a little bit. So, you know, just that reminder to keep coming back to those essential components is really, um, really helpful. Good. I'm glad. It is a lot of information to digest. That's why when we, you know, we stretch this out a little bit longer. These are these are snippets in one hour, but you're right. Um, it's definitely a lot, of, a lot of information. Yep. Definitely could be more components to include as well. Would love to hear your thoughts, Freddie, on, on maybe some other components too. Um, we will give you this. This is a um a checklist to think about with your teams. And it's just really for you to think about these different indicators, um, you know, in terms of your membership and commitment, the different roles and responsibilities. So basically we take you through this checklist of the that pie and just ask you to consider with your team members, uh, is this indicator fully in place? Is it partially in place or is it not in place at all? And this would be a document that we would recommend you come back to two to three times during your school year, right? To see uh, the growth that you're making in terms of establishing your effective teams. Any questions? We're going to wrap up. You bet. You're going to get these slides for sure. 
Tammy, you right. close that? Yeah. yeah, let's close this out. You're all tired. It's time to go. So again, we want to remind you the next one is happening um, February 7th. We're going to talk about the stages of implementation um, on that week. When you do get the slides, you'll be able to click directly on these images if you do want to come to those in-person workshops in either Vermont or Maine. Um, and then you also will get all of these handouts that you can see listed here. They're going to be within that folder. If for some reason they are not, you can also access them by clicking on these hyperlinks that you see here. Um, and with that being said, we want to thank you all so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and recognize how difficult it is to sit through an hour long webinar at the end of a school day. So thank you so much. Please remember to take that survey that will pop up as you close out of the browser that Lauren mentioned in the beginning. And then our contact information is on the next slide as well. Um, and please reach out if you have any questions. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you and seeing you all in the next webinar. Have Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.